So this has the potential to be one of the most jargon-filled titles of almost any paper. And you can start at the very beginning with hydrothermal, meaning essentially there's magma getting into the crust and heating up the water that's in the crust and then sending that into the oceans. In the modern day, this produces black and white smokers, which are where these large nutrient-rich plumes of water are just pushed upwards into the deep sea. And there is life around them, including some things like tube worms or even the Yeti crab. Then there's eutrophication, Eutrophication is a boost in the amount of life, and then you have macrobiological, which is just saying it's multicellular life. That part is really interesting when you look at the time frame of this paper, saying 2,100 million years ago. That is equal to 2.1 billion with a B years ago. So way, way back in Earth's history. This would put it back into the Paleoproterozoic, which went from about 2.5 to about 1.6 billion years ago, and is when the atmosphere started to at least slightly resemble what it is in the modern day with a bit more oxygen. The paper is specifically looking at fossils from the Francevillian region of Gabon, which is very much one of these really good hotspots for very early fossils that have brought up a lot of questions. And that's because some of them show things like burrowing, which we don't expect from fossils at this time because it's expected that there's not multicellular life at this time. This paper isn't really looking specifically at what kind of organisms might have made those kind of burrows, though. Instead, that was already done in a few other papers that went, hey, this looks like it could be a burrow system, and we don't really know what it could be because it's so old. So this paper just sat down and went, okay, well, how old is it for sure? And also, what were the conditions in this environment that could have potentially led to this? And they were very, very thorough with a lot of geochemistry actually happening here. They did things like thin sectioning of the iron carbonate layer that most of these kinds of fossils have been found in. And by that I mean they essentially ground parts of it really, really thin so they could look at it through a microscope and see what minerals were all present there. They also did geochemical tests to see what other chemicals might be present in those minerals. Because no mineral has a perfectly consistent composition, there's going to be other random atoms of other elements tossed in, and so looking at those can be important for understanding the ecosystem. Additionally, they looked at other things like how those chemical compositions may have changed over diagenesis. Essentially, when they're buried under the earth, there's a lot of pressure there and different things can start to form. If we can understand what kind of processes it went through when it was deep underground, we can potentially understand what the kind of parent rock and parent environment would have actually been present. They also looked at the kind of nutrients that might have been present in this environment by looking at rare earth elements. Because they're rare, but they do show up in hydrothermal activity, it helps to be able to kind of track, okay, how much hydrothermal activity was there? And that also would have been bringing in a lot of other nutrients along with those REEs, rare earth elements. And then finally, they looked at two of the most important elements when it comes to life, which is carbon and nitrogen. And those have different isotopes in different places, and they looked at those isotopes. From this, they were able to make up two similar but slightly differing hypotheses on how this environment might have worked. And the first is if it was a more deep basin. And what that would have done is had a lot of runoff coming from the mountains, containing a lot of things like phosphorus, which is really important for life, it helps make up DNA, and all of those elements getting transported into parts of the ocean. These elements, which would have largely been dissolved in the water, would then sink towards the bottom, where the hydrothermal activity would have introduced the rest of the minerals needed for life to essentially have an explosion. With it being so deep too, it also mirrors some earlier experiments about multicellularity using yeast. The researchers essentially had single-celled yeast, put it in a beaker, and then every now and then would just drain the bottom little part of it. So essentially, heavier cells of this yeast would be more successful. They would have this environmental pressure to sink down to the bottom, and then they could reproduce. And what they found is actually after a few generations, these yeasts started to actually become multicellular so that they could have more of that weight. That previous yeast research, along with this potential idea of all these nutrients coming to the deep ocean, could potentially have led to a fairly similar kind of environmental pressure, with larger cells getting to sink down more, having more nutrients, and then potentially multicellularity evolving out of that, leading to some of the first multicellular organisms anywhere in the world. Alternatively, if it was a shallow sea basin, it would have probably had a bit more hydrothermal activity, and all of those chemicals wouldn't necessarily have sunk down to the bottom as much. However, then you would have a lot more mixing in the water column, meaning that the photosynthetic life at the top would be more able to actually capitalize on both sunlight and the other nutrients available. Various waste products produced by these organisms would then still be able to sink down towards the bottom, which again, more mixing in this ocean, so that's still a very nutrient-rich area, that would be able to allow more multicellular life to again develop in the deep parts of the ocean.
What this means is essentially there's two separate models which could have happened that could have led to multicellular life. And this is the first multicellular life anywhere in the world. And way, way before anyone would have expected it, especially based on genetics of when modern day multicellular life would have split. Because that date is much more recent. What this means is the different kinds of organisms that were making those burrows, they weren't necessarily animals or anything else that's around today. In fact, they were probably totally different from what's around today, not related to anything that's alive. This is essentially because the Francilian Basin would have essentially been cut off from the rest of the oceans because of a large amount of water flowing inward. And these organisms weren't exactly designed to be able to get out of that basin, especially when the oceans in other parts of the world were not necessarily so nutrient rich. What this means is these are the first multicellular organisms and they're all dead. There's no descendants of them. It was this first experimentation into being multicellular and it didn't succeed. It's not related to us or plants or anything else. That said, this does kind of mirror what we expect happened in the lead up to the Cambrian explosion. And that's because it seems like this was right after the great oxygenation event, when stromatolites and other photosynthetic bacteria and algae started to develop much more rapidly. And from that, they were able to release a lot more oxygen into the environment. That combined with these nutrient rich waters allowed life to flourish, at least for some time. Unfortunately, because this was an isolated basin between two different plates coming together, and then there was also a giant ice sheet that eventually covered the planet just a few million years later, it wasn't exactly great for that life. They did die out. However, when we also look at the Cambrian explosion, what you have is more oxygenation occurring as life redeveloped after that glaciation event, but also a lot of that erosion that was caused by those glaciers introduced a lot more nutrients into the ocean. So rather than being hydrothermal activity, it was the glaciers that caused the erosion of different rocks on land that then went into the ocean and provided the nutrients for the Cambrian explosion. So we see these really similar parallels between these two environments. It's just that ours was successful and the Francilian one wasn't. 